Deshaun Leon McCormick was born August 17, 2007, and lived in Anchorage, Alaska. In March 2012, his mother Jasmine fled Alaska and took three of her four children with her, but didn't take Deshaun because his father, Floyd Leroy Lee Jr., had custody of him. Deshaun would stay with his father and stepmother, Mary Transky. On April 1st, 2013, the FBI came to their home to arrest Floyd on federal fraud charges after defrauding Anchorage area investors. However, Deshaun wasn't with him and he refused to reveal his location. Floyd and his wife both were sentenced to prison for fraud but have since been released. Neither his father nor stepmother have offered any insight or information as to where Deshaun might be. After his father and stepmother were arrested, a witness came forward and said Deshaun's stepmother had claimed she had killed the child and buried him on her property. When police asked Deshaun's stepmother about this, she said it never happened. Even though 2013 is the official recognized date of Deshaun's disappearance, some accounts suggest he may have vanished even earlier. Judy Holmes, Deshaun's step-grandmother, says the last time she saw the boy was on July 4th, 2012. He had a burn mark on his left thigh and a scar on the center of his forehead. His mother hopes he was given to another family before Floyd's arrest. He would be 14 years old in 2021, but he has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Erin Marie Gilbert was born May 4, 1971, and lived in Girdwood, Alaska. She was described as tall, athletic, confident, and outgoing, and she enjoyed writing poetry in the outdoors. She moved to Alaska in 1994 and had lived there for a year when she was 24 years old. Prior to that, she lived in San Francisco and Washington. She lived with her sister Stephanie and her brother-in-law at the Elmendorf Air Force Base and worked as a nanny. On July 1, 1995, she went on a date with a man named David Combs that she had met a couple days earlier at a bar called Chilkoot Charlie's in Anchorage, which is now called Coots. David picked Erin up at her home and met her sister and brother-in-law. They thought he appeared sketchy and didn't make a good impression. The two would leave to go to the fair around 4 p.m., which was about an hour away. She was last seen at the fair's beer garden with David and his friends about 6 p.m. David stated that at 6 p.m. they went to his car and it wouldn't start because he had left his lights on. He told Erin he would walk to a nearby friend's house for help. Strangely, instead of asking for jumper cables in the crowded parking lot, he claims that he walked for two hours but never found the friend's house so he returned to the car. He said that Aaron was gone by the time he got back and he thought she might have returned to the fair. When he tried the ignition again, the car started right up with no problem. He went back to the fair and searched for her until 1 a.m. but couldn't find her. At 7 a.m., he called her sister and asked if she had made it home, and her sister immediately knew something bad had happened. She called the police, and her family drove to Girdwood and had her name announced on stage at the fair and searched the festival and the nearby woods. An extensive search involving dogs and helicopters turned up no sign of her. Strangely, David did not help search for Aaron after that morning and was questioned by the police but refused to take a polygraph test, but he is not being considered a suspect. Aaron has never been located and the case remains unsolved. Thomas Anthony Nuzzi was born January 23, 1949. In 2001, he was a 52-year-old registered nurse who traveled around Alaska working and living in hotels and motels for months at a time and did not have a permanent address. Thomas was scheduled to report for work in Bethel, Alaska on June 19, 2001, but he never showed up. As this was completely unlike him, his co-workers reported him missing two days later. He was last seen by friends on June 15, 2001, but was later seen on surveillance cameras on June 18 at a store near the Super 8 Hotel where he was staying. At 9.47 p.m., he purchased cigarettes, two lighters, chips, and soda at a nearby gas station. Strangely, Thomas didn't smoke and didn't allow anyone to smoke in his vehicle. This is the last time he has ever been seen. 
After his disappearance, his red 1997 Jeep Cherokee was found at the Alpenglow Ski Area in Chugat State Park, 12 miles outside of Anchorage with his keys inside, along with cigarettes and a red rose. A security guard reported witnessing a woman and a man attempting to break into his Jeep on June 15th, three days before he was seen on video at the convenience store. The same woman was apparently standing next to him at the gas station on the night he was last seen. On June 18th, the same night that he was seen inside the gas station, people living across the street from his hotel saw a man and a woman, apparently the same couple, again attempting to break into his Jeep. The man eventually got into the Jeep and drove away. A housekeeper at the Super 8 says she saw a man lying on the floor of Thomas's room on the morning of June 19th, the day he was reported missing. She came back in the afternoon and saw the same man sitting in Thomas's room on the bed. She made him leave, and neither he nor the woman have been seen since. The woman is described as Caucasian and possibly in her 20s, about 5'2 and very thin with dark hair past her shoulders. The man is described as tall, thin, and dark-skinned with decaying teeth. According to Thomas's friend, Harold Guernsey, on the day of his disappearance, he had called Thomas's hotel room he had been staying in and said that an unfamiliar man answered the phone. The man then gave the phone to an unidentified woman who told him that Thomas had checked out and hung up the phone. It was later discovered that Thomas hadn't officially checked out of the motel. Thomas's nephew, New Jersey native Stephen Reeves, had just graduated college and was spending his summer exploring Alaska. He and a traveling companion dropped their vacation plans and joined the search for Thomas right away. He called back all the recent dialed, missed, and received phone calls on his cell phone. Several of the numbers connected to pagers and motels and one to a halfway house. None of the people who answered had heard of Thomas. He also went to Thomas's storage unit and found it unlocked. Inside were his cell phone, wallet with credit cards, his ID still inside, and Thomas's mountain bike. This was strange because it seems that he would have had these items on him. Also, Thomas had a 38 caliber handgun that was missing. This is when he found the receipt from the gas station purchases made a few days earlier. On June 28, he appealed to detectives to try to get someone assigned to the case, but was told the department couldn't spare one. When his nephew provided all his findings to police, they agreed to assign a detective, but the case went cold. It is unknown what happened to Thomas, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Hiroko Nomoto was born June 6, 1962 in Japan. In 1998, she was a senior at Michigan State University studying psychology and lived in East Lansing, Michigan. She had just finished the spring semester and was only 10 credits away from earning her bachelor's degree when she told a friend that she did not plan to return to school the following semester. She believed that her degree would lead to employment solely in research, but she wanted to work in clinical psychology. Her friend also stated that Hiroko sold the majority of her clothing and personal belongings in early June and gave away numerous Japanese mementos. She said she planned to stay in Alaska for a month, but strangely purchased a one-way plane ticket. She landed in Alaska on June 3, 1998, and authorities determined that she traveled to Denali National Park and Preserve near Mount McKinley after arriving and spent her first night at the Denali Windsong Lodge. The next day, she returned to Anchorage and spent the night at a hostel at 700 H Street before traveling to Wasilla, about 50 miles north of Anchorage. She then purchased a train ticket from Anchorage to Whittier and a ferry ticket from Whittier to Valdez, but it is unclear if she arrived at her destinations. Her mother, who lives in Japan, contacted the Japanese consulate in Michigan about a month after her daughter arrived in Alaska. The Japanese consulate then called East Lansing police. Apparently, Hiroko, a straight-A student, was depressed after receiving a B in a class. Although foul play is a possibility, suicide is also possible. But she is not believed to have jumped overboard, as she couldn't have jumped without somebody seeing her. She has never been located, and her family still seeks answers, but as of today, this case remains unsolved.
Linda Louise Geek was born on February 20th, 1983, and was described as a loving and thoughtful person. At the age of 14, she entered into the foster system and went to live with the Sims family. After becoming an adult and moving out, she still kept a close relationship with her adoptive parents and siblings. As she got older, she began having a problem with alcohol and even checked herself into rehab multiple times. At the age of 20, Linda had a daughter, but the relationship with the child's father didn't last. In 2008, she married Thomas Skeet Jr. and the couple later had two children. At the time of their marriage, Thomas had a case pending from a sexual assault charge on a young teen. However, Linda did not find out about it until after the marriage and was very upset. They moved from Juneau, Alaska to an apartment on Morningside Loop in Anchorage in 2015. Linda had a very good job, which allowed Thomas to stay home with their two school-aged children. Thomas and Linda had a very tumultuous relationship, causing problems in their marriage. It got so bad that a month after moving to Anchorage, Linda allegedly pointed a loaded gun at Thomas in front of their seven-year-old daughter. That same month, she filed for a protective order against him for herself and their two children. She claimed Thomas had assaulted her by grabbing her by the arm and pushing her and had left bruises on her chest. However, 10 days later, she withdrew the petition and the two reconciled. On top of all their other issues, Linda and Thomas were having extramarital affairs. According to Thomas, Linda would often leave home on weekend drinking binges, but would always return by Sunday night so she would be able to go to work on Monday, basically describing her as a highly functional alcoholic. On New Year's Eve of 2015, the couple and their five and seven-year-old children watched the movie Minions while sitting in their new Lincoln Navigator and then watched fireworks downtown. Thomas said during this time, the couple was arguing and Linda was drinking. From there, surveillance footage captures Thomas dropping Linda off at three different bars in Anchorage and a strip club while he and the kids waited in the car. Thomas stated that he waited until she was ready to go to a different bar and he would drive her. They all arrived home at 1 a.m. the next morning. According to Thomas, Linda kept drinking and wanted to drive back downtown to visit another bar, but he took the car keys away from her and they got into an argument about it. Linda screamed at him and then left on foot at 2.30 a.m. The couple had only one cell phone and it was left behind with Thomas. It would be three days before Thomas would report her missing and he only did so after pressure from Linda's foster mother, Rena Sims. Rena says that after Linda disappeared, he would no longer allow the kids to talk to her, which was immediately a red flag. She repeatedly asked him if he had killed Linda, and he kept saying no, but then strangely said, I don't think so. She repeated, you don't think so? And he said, no, I did not kill Linda. She then called the police with the new information, leading police to search their apartment and vehicle. Investigators found small amounts of Linda's blood in several areas of their apartment and believe Thomas murdered Linda there and tried to clean up the crime scene. While searching the apartment, investigators would find some clothes in the dryer that appeared to have been washed with too much bleach. They also found a notation on the calendar for January 1st that read, 2.30 a.m. Linda walked off. It was discovered that Thomas purchased bleach, ammonia, and a large amount of Lysol at Fred Meyer hours after Linda disappeared. One of the couple's children said that she had seen Linda's feet in the downstairs bathroom with blood all around it on the night of her disappearance. After the search was completed, Thomas was charged with murder and evidence tampering in her case. Although three weeks had passed since she disappeared, when he was arrested, police noted a possible human bite mark on his right arm, as well as some bruising on his neck, collarbone, back, and hip. The woman who lived in the unit above the Skeeks reported hearing a loud fight in the early morning hours of January 1st and said Thomas was angry and swearing, and it sounded like Linda asked for a divorce. Then the neighbor heard the sound of glass breaking and things being thrown, and there was a large bang and a jolt that knocked a photo off the neighbor's own wall. She never heard anything from Linda after that. She said the last time there was an incident like that, she had called the police, and the couple later asked her not to do that again, so she didn't. 
When Thomas told Linda's biological mother she was missing, he added, they'll never find her. The man that Linda was having an affair with came forward to clear his name and had a solid alibi. The woman that Thomas was having an affair with moved in the home shortly afterwards. For three years, while waiting for trial, Thomas remained at pre-trial detention. At his trial in 2019, Thomas's defense argued that there was not enough evidence to prove that Linda was deceased and that if she was, there was insufficient evidence to prove that he was responsible. His attorney suggested she had been the victim of a random attacker, was struck and killed by a drunk driver, or deliberately walked out of her life. Strangely, one of their neighbors said that she had seen Linda walking from the home at 10.48 p.m. that night, stating that she was going to paint the town red. Although the witness says that she was sure of the time, this could not be correct because at this time, surveillance cameras had caught Linda going in and out of bars that New Year's Eve while Thomas and the children waited in the vehicle. It is speculated that Thomas killed Linda during their fight after returning home during the early morning hours of January 1, 2016, and either stored her body or evidence in the crawl space until he could dispose of it. Another strange incident involving the crawl space in the basement was one of his family members witnessed him crawling into the space after Linda's disappearance, and he stated he was getting a piece of artwork. At the end of the trial, the jury would deliberate for three hours and return a shocking verdict. Thomas Skeet Jr. was acquitted of all charges. As of today, Linda has never been found and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>